Hi guys, and welcome back to another Unity tutorial. This is the first video in a new beginner series in which we will be making a 2D apple picker game. This series will be suitable for anyone ranging from a complete beginner who has never touched Unity before, to someone who has been using it for a couple of months. But if you have more experience than that, this may be too simple for you. Today we will cover creating the apples and spawning them randomly. If you're new here, I'm an indie game developer and I post tutorials like this as well as devlogs documenting my progress with my games, so if any of that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing. Without further ado, let's get started. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new project, so I'll hit the new, select the 2D template, and rename the project. I'm going to call it Apple Picker. Next, I'll hit create and wait for it to load. The first thing I'm going to do is rearrange our window layout. We're not going to need the asset store, so I'll right click on it and close the tab. Next, I'll move the scene view to the top left, put the game underneath the scene view, put the project on the left side of the inspector, put the hierarchy on the left side of the project, and finally put the console underneath the hierarchy. This is simply my preferred layout, but you can use any layout you want to. I will also go to the project tab, right click on it, and select the one column layout. And finally, I'll go to the game, and under free aspect, I'll select 16 to 9 ratio to always keep it constant, no matter how big the window is. With that out of the way, the next thing I'm going to do is create the apple object. In the sample scene, I'll right click, go to 2D object, and select sprite. I'll press F2 to rename it, and call it apple. I will also zoom in a bit so that we can see it more clearly. On the inspector, we can see that the sprite renderer has the sprite object set to none. If we click on the circle icon to the right of it, we can select the knob, which is a circle, and then we can change its colour to red. Next, I will scale it up on the X and Y, both to 3, so that we can see it a bit more clearly. I will also go down to the Add Component button at the bottom of the inspector, and select Circle Collider. This will allow us to interact with the apple later. However, if I hit play, you will notice that there is no gravity, that nothing is happening to the apple. To fix this, let's exit the play mode and go down to the Add Component button again. This time we'll add a Rigid Body 2D. Rigid body components allow physics to act on an object, so anytime you want gravity, collisions or anything like that, remember to add the rigid body component. Now if I hit play, you should see that gravity works. The next step is to destroy the apple when it leaves the screen, as if we do not, it will keep on falling forever. To do this, let's create a new folder in the assets by right clicking, create, folder, and I'll call this scripts. Right click in the scripts folder and go to create c -sharp script, and I'll call this apple. Give it a moment to compile, then double click to open it up in Visual Studios. For the sake of performance, I will use Visual Studio code, but know that everything will work exactly the same. In this script, we want to determine whether the apple has left the screen or not, and if it has, we want to destroy the object. To do this, I'll declare a variable, float, bottom, y. To determine what to set it to, I'll go back to the Unity editor, select the apple, and hit W to allow us to move it. Now, if I drag it down until it is no longer within the screen, we can see that its y value is minus 5.63. I'll reset it back to 0, then go back to the script and set it equal to minus 6 just to be safe. As it is a float, I'll add an f after the minus 6 to tell Unity that this is a float number. Now we need to destroy the apple if it falls below this value. To do this, we will check its position every frame, and if it is below the bottom y variable, we will destroy the object. To do this, let's make some space, then type void update, add two parentheses, and then some curly braces. If you're in Visual Studios, it will likely add a private to the front like this. Just know that whether you do or don't have the private keyword, it will still work exactly the same way. I'll leave it without for now. Inside here, we need to check if transform 
dot position dot y is less than bottom y, which is the variable we just made up here. And if it is, add curly braces, then we want to destroy this game object. The update function is called every frame automatically, and in it we check if transform.position.y is less than our bottom y variable, in this case minus 6. Transform refers to the transform component of the apple, position refers to the position variable, and y is its up or down value, so if I decrease y it will move down. So essentially when y falls below negative 6, so at this point it will destroy the object. In Unity, items are called game objects, and when we just type game object like this, we get a reference to ourself. This means that the destroy function will destroy whatever game object the script is attached to. To make it clearer for yourself, you could also type this dot game object, but I will leave it as it was before, as it is unnecessary. Now to test out this script, make sure to save it, then return back to the Unity editor. I'll select the apple then drag and drop the script into it in the inspector. Now if we play the game, you should see the apple fall, then when it moves below the screen, it should disappear from the scene view. Great, it all seems to be working, so let's move on to the next step, which will be spawning the apples. In the sample scene, I'll right click, then create an empty, and I'll call this apple spawner. I'll reset its transform. In the scripts folder, I'll right click, then create a new C sharp script, which I'll call Apple Spawner. Give it a moment to compile, then double click to open it up in Visual Studios. To spawn the apple, we need a reference to what we call a prefab of the apple. To do this, I'll type public game object apple prefab and end with a semicolon. Now if I go back to Unity Editor, select the Apple Spawner object, and drag our script onto it, you'll see that there is a slot here for the Apple Prefab. To make this prefab, I'll go to the Assets folder, Create, Folder, Prefabs, and then simply drag and drop our Apple into this folder. Now if I delete the Apple from the scene, you'll see that I can drag this Apple from the Prefabs folder, and it will create an exact copy of it, with all of the components attached. That's all that a prefab really is, just an exact copy of an item, or a game object. So now if I click on the Apple Spawner object, I can drag this Apple prefab into the slot, and that sets it just like that. I'll return back to the script now, and create a new function. To create a function, we have to specify what it returns, in this case, I don't want to return anything, so I'll type void, and then give the function a name. So I'll call this function spawn apple, two parentheses, and then curly braces. Just in case you're wondering, things that it can return are things like integers, floats, which are decimal point numbers, and booleans, which is a true or false. But in this case, I'll just leave it as void. To test it out, I will start by typing instantiate, which is Unity's fancy way of saying spawn, and then I'll put the apple prefab in, end it with a semicolon. But now this function won't actually run yet because we aren't calling it from anywhere. So above that, I'll add void start, which is automatically called when the game starts. And then to call the spawn apple function, I'll type spawn apple and the two parentheses, then a semicolon. Now if I return back to the editor, we can hit play and check that everything's working. Great, that all works, so let's go back to the script and modify it. The first thing I want to change is making the apple spawn in a random position. To do this, in the instantiate function, we can pass in a position as well as a rotation. As we want the rotation to be zero, we can replace it with quaternion.identity which just means no rotation. For the position, we want somewhere that starts above the screen, but with a random left and right position. To do this, I'll create a new variable, which will be vector3 spawn position, and I'll set that to a new vector3. 
into this vector 3, we need to give it an x, y, and a z position. If you remember from earlier, y is the vertical position, and negative 6 meant that it was below the screen. Therefore, if we put positive 6, that should start it above the screen. In Unity, the z axis is forward and back, and as we don't want it to move forward or backwards, we can set that to 0. For the x position, we want to randomize it, and luckily for us, there's a built-in function which already does that. I'll create a new variable, which will be type of float, and I'll call it random x position. I'll set this equal to random dot range, and then we need to pass in the range that we want it to choose the numbers from. In order to do this, let's return back to the Unity editor and try moving the apple left and right. You'll see that the value in the inspector changes. I can see that the left side is approximately negative 8, and at the right side it should also be approximately 8. So I'll set the range between negative 8, f for float, to positive 8, f for float again, and end it with a semicolon. Now for the x position, I'll set that equal to random x position. The final thing we need to do in the script is replace this position with our spawn position variable. Now if we return back to the editor and press play, we should see an apple spawn in a random spot above the screen, then fall down and destroy itself when it leaves the screen. Great, it seems to be working. I'll stop the game and start it a few times to make sure that the apple does spawn in a random position. It all seems to be working, so let's move on to the final step. I'll also reset the value of the apple spawner because I forgot to do that earlier. Let's return back to the script, and now we want to spawn the apples continuously. There are several ways to do this, but the easiest one is using what we call coroutines. To use it, we want to go to the top and add a using tag, which we're using system.collections, and add a semicolon. Now, I said that we don't want to return anything with this spawn apple function, but now we're going to replace the void with an i enumerator. Don't worry about exactly what this is, but essentially it allows us to run the function over a period of time as opposed to instantly as it usually would run. Using it, we can now say while true to create an infinite loop, then inside the parentheses, place everything that we typed earlier. Just like that. However, we do need to return an i enumerator. So at the bottom of the true loop, I'll say yield return new wait four seconds, which is just the funky syntax that we use to wait for a certain amount of time. Then in brackets, I'll put one. This will tell it to wait one second and then repeat the loop. One more thing that we have to do since we're using a coroutine is we can't just call spawn apple normally. Instead, we have to type start coroutine and then put that all in brackets, just like that. If you didn't understand everything that we just did, don't worry about it, as once you have used Unity for a bit more, you will come to understand what all of these different things do. Just know that this is the easiest way to continuously spawn items. Also, I've spelt start coroutine wrong, make sure you have a T there. And let's go back to the editor now. If I hit the play button, we should see apples spawning every second, forever. Great, it all seems to be working. There's one more thing that we could do to make this nicer to use, and that would be add a variable for the amount of time between spawning apples. To do this, we can simply type public float spawn delay, which is what I'll call it. You can call the variable anything you like, and I'll set that equal to one, just as the default value. Now, instead of setting one second in the wait for seconds, I'll say wait for the spawn delay. Now if we return back to the editor, click on the apple spawner, and you should see a new variable pop up which is called spawn delay, and you can edit it here in the inspector. So if I press play now, the apples start spawning, and I can change the delay between the spawns simply by dragging this slider. 
This is a great way to determine the ideal spawn delay, as it stops you from needing to go back to the script, change the spawn delay variable, come back here, let it compile, and play the game every time to test a different value, as you can simply just drag this slider around. That's all I've got for you for this tutorial. I hope you found it useful. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe, and share this with your friends. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.